Jesus' revolutionary Sermon on the Mount begins with telling people how to get what everyone wants and what so few people find. His opening statements are called Beatitudes because they address the core attitudes of the heart, the character traits of the soul, of those who want to become and stay in God's kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is God's kingdom, kingdom living. It's not meant to be heard, it's meant to be lived. They speak about the core wisdom that this world is looking for, for ultimate quality life. John 10, 10, John, Jesus came to give us life to the full. And this morning, we're focusing on Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, and that will conclude our series on the Beatitudes. Everyone wants to be happy and to experience satisfaction and joy and contentment, and so few people accept the one true source that offers and promises that. Because you have to sacrifice yourself, pridefully so. Get rid of that and seek God. And that's the key. In fact, since this is the conclusion to our series, let's have a fun verse-by-verse verse review of how these are the building blocks in progression for true happiness, the happiness that God offers. In verse 3, if I'm not humble, I lose any chance of happiness. If I don't remember that God is God and I'm not, there's no way I can enjoy the blessings that God wants for me. And then as I look at God, what happens? I mourn, verse 4, over my condition. I realize that I'm in sin and, and I want righteousness from God. And, and yet as I seek God, then God will give me that happiness as I mourn over the, the sinfulness of my, my soul and also uh, the, the suffering that comes into this world that I have no control over, my own lack of goodness. So I seek God who is the source of all that, see? And then in verse 5, as I see God's wisdom and strength and following my life after him and letting him direct me, that's what meekness is all about, the spiritual fruit of gentleness. All of the strength that God has given me anyway is now under God's control. He is guiding me at every turn as I willfully yield and obey, and that's the key. But then in verse 6, as I'm seeking God's strength and guidance, I'm hungering and thirsting for his righteousness. I need it more and more every day. And then in verse 7, I find that. And as I find that, I'm merciful to others because God is so merciful, generous, good to me. And then that does affect how I re respond to everyone else, and it should. And then in verse 8, you see how these are building? All of this happens as my heart is purified. I think less of myself continually, incessantly, and more about God as I seek his will for my life and my pur uh, his purposes for me. My heart is pure, singular of intent and motive and purpose. I just want to please God. That's it. And then there, therein is where happiness is found. All of this goes together, you see. And then in verse 9, through that purity of heart, I become a peacemaker. Why? How? Because I've become at peace with God. And I'm living in his righteousness, growing every day. And I want others to enjoy that blessing as well, to be in a right standing with God, to be at peace in their relationship and in the process, go about wherever something would dis cause discord or, or, or threaten that peace and harmony to bring reconciliation possible. That's great. Building godly relationships and stealing the desire for others to do likewise because it's just who you are is who is in you at that point and you're helping share it with others. This on the screen is an entirely different path to happiness and joy than the world is conditioning you to follow. And we illustrated in our first lesson that people are pridefully going down a lot of dead-end roads to find so-called happiness from success as the world describes it. Pleasures, as in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon says, I'm just going to do whatever I want. If it feels good, do it. Possessions, if I don't have it and if I see it, I want to get it. That'll make me happy, right? And then positions, he was the best. He was the most powerful person on earth. He had it all. And Solomon says, that doesn't work. And yet still so many people travel those dead-end roads hoping to find joy from spiritual joy from worldly things. That's ironic to say that, isn't it? They're hoping to find spiritual joy from worldly things. That's not how it comes about. Spiritual contentment comes from the God who is above this world, who will help you live through this world. And that's the key. You and I as Christians are those who have allowed God, to stay, Jesus, to take the wheel. He's not just my passenger. He's not just along for the ride. He's my GPS system wired into the very engine of my soul. Guide me at every turn, Lord. I'm here. Take the wheel. 
And I like that. If we follow his directions, life makes sense. Not always easy, but at least it makes sense. I jokingly say, even when it doesn't make sense, it makes sense. And we are spiritually happy no matter the trials that we go through. And now let's look at that last beatitude. Blessed or how very happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But it's only after the building blocks of the others that you could possibly rejoice in persecution for the right reason. We're going to examine this today. You and I made the only right choice to follow Christ. But not everyone does. I want you to think about this for a moment. I'm going to make two statements. They begin the same way, but they have two totally different meanings by the ending. The world crucified Christ. The world crucified Christ. And from their perspective, yes, they would do that again. The world persecuted or crucified Christ. Oh, yes, we follow Christ. As you mature in righteousness, letting God's light shine, those opposing godliness will hate you and mistreat you. There's no sugarcoat for this. It's a fact we simply must accept. Jesus tells us that we should not expect any different treatment from the world toward us as he himself endured. Today, millions of people either ignorantly or blatantly have chosen evil a path from, apart from God's path of righteousness. And those people still persecute Jesus today by how they treat his followers. But how can we possibly maintain an indestructible happiness as a result of this? You and I must remember a few key things that we have made the right choice to follow Christ and his righteous will. There is no other right choice to make. Do we give it up? No. We have the priceless gift of salvation. We have the spiritual joy from living in light of God's truth, which we wouldn't want to live one second without. We have the promise of heaven. We wouldn't trade any of that, but it still doesn't make certain times easy to live in this world when you have opposition from those who haven't chosen God's will for us in this world. In fact, it's exceptionally challenging the more spiritual you become, the more deeply we care about and the more passionate we live for holy things, the more that ungodly people will hate and mistreat you. We will naturally encounter Many with the intent to make your life miserable. And I'm eager then to hear how I can be spiritually joyful in this sin-fallen world. Because like I said, there's no other right choice to make. And if the reality of persecution is something I have to deal with, Lord, help me deal with it. How? So this was a fun lesson for me to study for. It's not an easy lesson to share. But this final beatitude is very unique in many ways. It's the only one that Jesus gives more space to than any other. Based on how you count them, some people say there are more than eight, but, but he extends this concept and he repeats it and he explains it. And it's the only one he personalizes. He doesn't say, blessed are they, blessed is the one, blessed is he or she, but bless, in this case, blessed are you. He really wants you to know he's talking about you. Blessed are you when this occurs. The other seven addresses the Christian's character and development, but in this case, it addresses the world's behavior and character. Jesus would teach by this, par uh, by this beatitude, happy and healthy are those who can handle rejection and withstand attacks on their faith. I want to be happy and I want to be healthy, so I've got to learn, as well as we all do, how to handle rejection for Christ's sake, and withstand attacks on our faith. So let's first notice the reality of persecution. Since the verse is clear, we won't spend much time on this. He doesn't say if, he, but he says when. It's a given. Blessed are you when men insult you and when they persecute you. Jesus specifies in verse 11 here three things that people love to do to Christians in any generation. Number one, the world loves to insult the Christian 
anything to dishonor, anything to discredit, anything to say derogatory things about you, even if they know it's not true, it doesn't matter to them. You think those standards of righteousness apply? Of course not. They're not in right standing with God, so they won't mind at all to insult you. But they will also mistreat you. Maybe physical, maybe psychological, maybe emotional, maybe social isolation, maybe in no way that can be proven in a court of law, but you see it, you know it. It's there, and they know it. If the first two do not work effectively on you, guess what they'll do? Then they'll just make stuff up. They'll lie about you. Again, they don't care about righteous standards, so why should they hinder themselves from attacking those who represent what they hate? Righteousness. The unrighteous love to find fault with Christians. That's why it's challenging on us to raise the bar of standard uh, of godly behavior and, be, and living for us. Look to Jesus because anytime we mess up and, and we're not humble about it, then the world has their job cut out for them. I mean, or I should say made easy for them, right? It makes it easy for the world when they find fault with Christians. But if you walk uprightly with integrity and honor, they'll just make stuff up. But does that mean we shouldn't walk with integrity and uprightness and honor? No, we have no other right choice. But when you do, and if the first two don't work, they'll just lie about you. Jesus was perfect, and they lied about him. He was called and accused of every evil that he had come to defeat. He was called a glutton. He was called a drunk. He was called an illegitimate son of a Roman soldier. Even being of the devil himself, lies, nothing but lies for the only righteous one that ever lived on earth he knows what it's like. Why are we harassed? And how can we possibly be happy about it? Let's ask that question, and let's look at some reasons why persecution comes. First, let's look at why it comes for the wrong reasons. God doesn't bless this type of, happen, uh, this, this, uh, type of behavior that I'm about to mention with his happiness. This beatitude does not promise or offer any divine joy or contentment if you are... Even representing Christ by being irritating, unpleasant, or even self-righteous. A lot of my preacher, well, they're not, they're not really my preacher friends, but a lot of preacher associations that I've come across, I sure hope they're watching, and you can tag some people in it, but don't let other people know that, right? Uh, I don't know what it is about in the group of preaching and Christians who just uh, realize that this is the standard, but you're not. This is the authority, but you're not. They need to hear some points that I'm about to mention. It's better for us to encounter such a person than to be that type of person. Way too often, religious spokesmen refuse to let the word change their character and heart. They are driven to preach the authoritative word as an ego fix because it makes them feel like they are the authoritative ones. And God is on their side. They are self-proclaimed prophets, setting themselves up for emotional martyrdom by being, and here's a thesaurus experience for you, they set themselves up for the persecution that they think they're receiving for being righteous when they're really just loud, noisy, stubborn, obnoxious, smug, condescending, offensive, arrogant, and combative. And the world simply treats them the same way that they're treating it. No surprise, God does not command that type of so-called faith. So. By contrast, what is the type of persecution that does receive the blessing of happiness, spiritual contentment and joy and groundedness uh, for what legitimate reason? What's the legitimate reason that will yield this promise of blessing? It's for being like him. That's why. It's for being like him. Not the Jesus you've made into fitting your personality, but the personality you've adjusted to be like Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 shares how easy it is to face and encounter opposition. Here's how easy it is. You want to be persecuted? Well, no one really does, but here's a simple way to do it. Be godly. And again, we're supposed to be godly. There's no other right choice, so just be godly, and it's going to happen. As you express God's light of truth to the lost, you will encounter harassment. John 15, 20, Jesus says, No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. As you become more, not serious, but sincere and matured in, in your spiritual walk, more genuinely demonstrative or demonstrative and, and vocal, you will solicit the treatment that the world has to offer. It's not that you want it. 
It's just that there's no other way that the world will respond in case they have a, a, an, offer, a, a, an evil heart. Uh, they, they will show you their heart by their treatment of you. It's just going to naturally occur. So frankly, if you never encounter opposition, could it be that the world can't see any difference in you? If you never encounter that type of opposition, ever? I believe that way too many Christians are too comfortable in the world's camouflage. When Paul says, becoming all things to all people, the context there does not imply <laughs> that we are to be a chameleon Christian where we come and go and, and no one knows. If you are the light of the world, you will reveal the darkness that are in other people's souls. And that's just what does it. You can't help but show light to the world for the people who will come to Christ. You can't not be an ambassador. You've got to be smart, yes, but, but you've also got to be an ambassador. And, and that will solicit it. So the truth is, the more godly you are, the more ungodly people will hate you because our sin-conquered world is uncomfortable around any objective moral standard of goodness and rightness. Jesus then would teach, blessed is the one harassed for holiness. Blessed is the one who are being mistreated because of being like me, like Christ. And if I, if I do, it, life's not fair, but at least, at least I know that that's what I'm being punished for or persecuted for. If I do experience persecution, I always should tell myself I would rather receive it for this reason and make sure there's no other reason. So as we continue, if we are like Christ, living for the Lord, encountering the opposition of this world that desperately needs to know the Lord and to be uh, saved from the people that, uh, saved by the ones, uh, it, let's see, if we're being persecuted by the people who need to be saved from the Christ that they are persecuting, then you and I just need to consistently represent him. So here's point three already, uh, section three. We can't deny our Lord. We have no other choice, right? We can't deny our Lord. So how do we respond to persecution? Jesus says we can do this by focusing on certain truths. And if we do focus on certain truths, we can be helped through the process and even happy during it. Now, I want to know the secret to that. So let's look at some key words. Remember. Remember what? The source. If we're being persecuted, in this case, remember the source. Revelation 12.10 calls the devil, calls Satan, the accuser of the brethren. I think that that applies across the board. The accuser of the brethren. Satan cannot directly hurt God, and so what he does is he, direct, he hurts his children. And we know how God is going to be towards that. You don't mess with my kids, right? God is the holy, righteous God. And while the devil is allowed to do certain things under God's sovereignty, yes, but contrary to his will, affecting and maturing us, Satan does try to harm us. And Scripture often, often describes what Satan is capable of doing. And that's why I reference only Ephesians 6.12 here. Our struggle is not against this creation, but against the powers of spiritual darkness in heavenly places. When you're persecuted for righteousness' sake... Whether they know it or not, those who harass us are, are the devil's pawns. Even from within, and Second Peter has a lot to say about that. Needing to be saved by the Jesus that they're persecuting. So remember the source. Remember your enemy. Remember what it's all about. And then, well, you have to refuse to retaliate. This is when being meek and gentle is not easy. The need for the Spirit's help then comes into play. Hebrews 10 Verse 30, Hebrews 10, verse 30, and it's teaching, lets me know God ensures us that his holy wrath is going to take care of all injustice. I don't know how many times a day I, I tell myself that God's holy wrath is going to take care of this. If they don't come to Christ and let the blood cover that, God's wrath will take care of this. But think of Jesus' march to that cross. Refusing to retaliate, Jesus basically says, be like him on earth. Stand boldly for truth, yes. Stand calmly, yes. Lovingly, yes. Endure the insults thrown at you and don't respond in like manner. Stay focused, Romans 12, 19 and 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We don't want to become like the very people that we are 
thankful we were saved from. We want to show them the light so don't go down to their level. You'd be playing into the devil's hands if you do. We cannot have the blessed happiness in our soul during persecution if we embrace the spirit of revenge. That kicks it out instantly. So we cannot control what happens to us. We cannot control what people say about us. They will mistreat us. They will lie about us. They will ridicule us. But we are able to temper how we respond and as we grow. The Christian's response is baffling to the lost. Sometimes it wins them over and sometimes it doesn't, but we still should do what's right. Your enemies do not expect you to express care and concern and love and to offer help in any way that you can and to pray for them. They don't care any about that, but it, it boggles their mind. Matthew 5, 44. And that's not easy. But those who obey are truly, truly happy. And therefore, we can, next point, rejoice. How can I rejoice in this suffering? There's some key words on the screen that will fill our next few moments of discussion. I want to know the reasons I can celebrate during persecution. I might, if I can celebrate, go ahead. If I'm going to experience it, might as well learn how to enjoy it. Uh, it's not that we rejoice in the pain like a masochist. Oh, no, 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 we don't want it. We're looking forward to heaven where there won't be any persecution, where, where we're freed from the devil's attacks and all of his minions. But it means that it means that the Spirit of God can be seen in my life. 1 Peter 4, 14, isn't that what we wanted in the first place? To, to, to become like Christ and to, and to know that we are growing to be like Him more every day? If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That would be such an encouragement to you to know that. That is it, it, just the only way the world responds and can confirm it, sad to say, the confirmation that you are letting the light of God be seen in your life. And of course, let me quickly say, do not use the degree of persecution as a gauge for your spirituality. Please don't do that. Uh, don't, yeah, it's safer to say God's spirit is simply bearing enough fruit that people are noticing. That's a good approach. The world see, needs less secret agent Christians. They need more audiovisual Christians, disciples who speak it, disciples who live it, and it takes both. If you're not telling it, you're not an ambassador. If you're not living it, you're not a disciple. And we need to be both. And persecution, for Christ's sake, does come when you are walking the talk. If you're not getting this type of persecution or ridicule on a periodic basis, then I'll ask you to examine the intensity of that light that's within you. Um, I'm also in good company. I'm also in good company. What kind of company? Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if your focus on that verse is the word persecuted, you think this is a negative passage. But if your focus is on the word prophets, then that's a lot of positives right there. In our growth group, we're now finally focusing on one prophet at a time and, and lifting these people up. God raised these people up to be examples for righteousness and to proclaim God's truth to nations that had gone astray and needing to come back by their obedience. And it wasn't easy. By their obedience, they secured an, eternal, an eternity of heaven. And I can be in that company. I look up to these role models and then the scriptures are telling me that with what I endure I'm in that same class by connection and association this is incredible I think about Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith where people like like Abel and Noah, uh, Noah and Moses and David and so many others were mentioned heroes of the faith as you read about them their accounts fill you with inspiration to serve God and to live for Him no matter what. But when you're reading Hebrews chapter 11 and you're considering all these points about persecution, do we ever consider what Hebrews 12 verse 1 is really saying? That every single role model of the faith the great cloud of witnesses that are cheering you on so you can lay aside all the weight that, that besets us in the sin which so easily ensnares and entangles us and run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Christ who also, like him, looked forward to the prize. Are, are we, did, we, did we miss that first part? The, the, the cloud of witnesses that are saying, you can do this, Michael. 
You can do this, Michael. Keep going. Don't quit. I know you want to, but don't quit. We didn't. We went through more, but look at us. We can relate to that, and our reward is worth it. Your reward is worth it. Don't quit. These are not, a, this is not a crowd of spectators. These are the martyrs of the faith saying, look at what we've been through. We did it, and it was worth it. You can too. Please consider this truth as you are experiencing the ridicule and find that strength that God wants and promises. Don't let anything stop you from this race. I am so eager to visit in victory with the people of old like Abel and Abraham and, and, and Joshua and, and Joseph, oh yes, Moses and, and the prophets. I can't wait. Oh yeah, and the apostles, we can't forget them. Acts chapter 5. Verse 41, Acts 5, 41 mentions that the apostles were basically threatened with their life for if they ever taught about Christ again. And they told the Sanhedrin, not going to happen. We can't help but speak. And it says in verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy, suffering disgrace for his name. I, as a kid, I used to find that so odd. I didn't understand. I tried my best to understand, but I just didn't want the persecution, so I couldn't understand the joy. And then you realize you experience it no matter what, and, and maturity happens over time. In this way, persecution is a badge of honor. If it's for being like Christ that you get it. And then one reason to rejoice is the key word temporary. It's only temporary. Even if there are life-lasting consequences, it's still only temporary. I don't know of anyone who was persecuted this side of the cross like Paul. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, we listened to that yesterday. Our light, or two days ago, our light and momentary afflictions. What did he say? Our light and momentary afflictions? What did Paul go through? I, don't, I wouldn't call them light. But all of this is working to achieve for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. There's that eternal perspective. He was beaten repeatedly, mocked all the time, life threats at every turn, stoned twice. You could have been killed from just one proper stoning and, and imprisoned four times, shipwrecked out in the sea day and night, beheaded. He still rejoiced because he kept that eternal perspective looking on to Christ. Anything we go through in this life is only temporary. That's good to know. So, letter D, or next point, remember your reward. Remember your reward. Let's have some fun with Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. How great? I can tell you exactly how great. Very. That's all I need to know right now. I doubt that there's any way that words could convey to us how great it will be. We might get into heaven at that moment, a split second, and look back and wonder if there is such a thing as time, and look back and say, wow, how, the clues were right in front of us. How could we not have seen how great this was? And perhaps we might be on the other end. I'm glad I've stayed faithful because there's no way we could have understood how great this was. Romans 8, 17, as children, we are heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Sharing in his glory, if how, if what, if we indeed suffer with him. How much glory does God have? And we will share in that? Wow. There's much that we don't know, but we are told this. Special honors and glories are due for those who have suffered persecution for Christ's sake. And every child of God receives varying measures of that on earth. Matthew 19, 29, I humorously say that living for Christ earns 10,000% interest in heaven's accounting books. Does anyone have a mutual fund earning 10,000% interest? I don't think so. But how great will your reward be? Very great. That's all we need to know. And then next, remain faithful. What other choice do we have, right? Remain faithful. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator. Continue to do good. There is no other right choice. Living for God in this world. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 10. I love this passage so much. 1 Peter 5, 6 and verse 10. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at proper time. And after you have suffered a little while, 
the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, and strengthen, and establish you. I want those promises. To me, I think of 1 Peter 5, 6, and 10 when I think about Matthew 5, 10 and this beatitude. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. This beatitude, and really our whole series, calls us to terms with certain realities. Question, how strong is your faith? Hmm, a few rhetorical questions. Are you not suffering much for your faith because there's not much there? Or are you today presently needing prayers to stay humble and godly because you are being attacked a lot for it lately? Christianity, obvious by today's lesson, it's not a health and wealth gospel, but it is a message of salvation. And it is a message of eternal life. And we receive the gift of forgiveness on earth and heaven eternal when we approach the cross where the Lord was persecuted to pay the price for sin. And that blessing is for anyone who follows the straight path system to the cross, the GPS, God's plan of salvation. Since we started our sermon series on the Beatitudes with these slides, let's take a moment to enjoy it one more time and type in the destination heaven because that's where I want to go. That's how I'm trying to live right now. And I sure don't want to give up. I can't quit. There's no other great alternative. It's the only right thing to do. And I want to enjoy doing it with all these principles that we've discussed. And I'm looking forward to heaven. It's going to be a great place. So how do we get there? From wherever background you are, the sins that have uh, burdened your life and tainted your soul, it cuts a straight path system to the cross. Wherever you are, from this point forward, straight to the cross. And it's in the form of repentance. Luke 13, 3. Turning from your way, following God. Is there any other? No. It's the standard. Follow God. And then as you're getting closer to this concept of maturing, you're getting there, you're building momentum, you confess. Confess what? Well, you, it's a combination of many things, but you do confess that, that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and you want to live a life of confession, and you own up to the sin that's in your life. And so all of this is happening uh, like a chemical process of the soul. It happens at the same time. And then you realize that, oh, Acts 2.38, there's a response. There's a God-ordained faith response in which when we yield to him, God does his work because we have obeyed, and yet it's God's work that, that when we are immersed in the waters of baptism— the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our soul because of our faith that contacts it. We participate. We spiritually participate in his crucifixion because like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we might also rise to walk in newness of life. You'll notice that car grew. I'm now in Christ. I'm contacting the cross where the blood was shed. But there's something else. We live faithfully. We stay strong. We continue no matter what. We continue no matter what until perhaps we pass or the Lord returns and we meet him in the air, but we still continue to grow until we go on to our reward and share in the Lord's glory. So excited about that. So eager for that. Well, the question of the day on the invitation slide where the gospel's faith response is illustrated and demonstrated, stand for righteousness and stay free in Christ. In Christ. If you're not in Christ, then you respond and contact that blood by the immersion of the, the act of baptism. God does his work to cleanse your soul, and we rise to walk in newness of life. And that's what we need. The Beatitudes are all about how to be happy. And if you are not happy because you're not in right standing with God, we can make it right and pray for your strength and health as we stand and as we sing.